Yo. Come on, man. This is Book Me or Not. I am Director Huey G. And uh, we're here with somebody very, very special, man. Um, spirit, real humble spirit. Um, somebody who loves the community, um, loves his people, mm -hmm. uh, conscious, and just really solid person, man. Uh, we appreciate you really just coming on. Um, I call this rolling, rolling, you know, from six. <laughs> uh, rolling, rolling, man. We're rolling, rolling, man. Appreciate you, man. Nice to have you, man. My man, I appreciate you, Big Mario. It's a pleasure to be here with you, good sir. And we're just gonna wrap a taste and share a little uh share a little love over the airway. Thank you, man. Uh but people don't know, man. Uh where you from? Well, I am from Savannah, Georgia. Again, my name is Jay Jones. I've been acting now for almost 30 years. Can you believe it? Almost 30 years in the business, man. So uh I'm I consider myself very blessed. I was born and raised in Savannah, I moved to Atlanta in 91 to go to Morehouse College, where I attended from 91 to 95. Uh, majored in English, minored in theater, thinking I was gonna potentially be a lawyer, and uh, ended up getting bitten by the acting bug. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a lifelong journey since then. So it's been a blessing. Hey, what does Savannah mean to you? Man, Savannah means a lot. You know, I don't get back as I often as I need to, but my whole family was born and raised down in Savannah. So my mom and my daddy are still down there. Siblings are still down there. Uh, my grandmother, who was the matriarch of the family, uh, was from the Fusky Island, which is a little island off of, a lot of people might know Hilton Head Island a little better, but the Fusky and Hilton Head are neighbors. And the Fusky Island was where a lot of black people went. They call them Gullah people, the Gullah Geechee yeah. community. And they, they still down there in the Fusky. So a lot of that element, my, 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 my pops is from Pinpoint, Georgia, which is another small little enclave of, of uh, black self-determined individuals who kept it real authentic during some uh, some some lean years. They kept the communities together. So it's a lot of black pride down in Savannah. It's a lot of uh, a lot of like I say, uh, entrepreneurism. A lot of uh, black excellence. So uh, I'm grateful to have been born and raised down on a little with what we call the Golden Isles down there in Savannah, Georgia. I can see that kind of uh, balance you out because you know you, you travel around and everything. So I know that kind of balances you. Always coming home, brothers. It's, it's, it's always a way to stay grounded, connected, and rooted to your people. You know what I'm saying? It's a, it's definitely an opportunity to to celebrate the foundation of it all when you get back to the crib. You know, you 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 are the streets, the people, the individuals, the schools, all of that had a hand in making you who you ultimately will become. So it's right. it's a blessing. I need to get down there more often, that's for sure. All right. Uh Jay Jones, let's talk about. Um, you know your story. When where the film first began for you, man? Take us to that time where you decided. You know, I'm getting into film, man. Take us there. It started when I was playing football. Actually, I broke my neck in a football game, hmm. and uh, this, this is in high school. So after I broke my neck, clearly I couldn't play football no more. But I used to wear this brace. When I broke my neck, they put me in this halo brace. It was a little thing where you got four points here, four points there, hmm. and it was keeping your neck perfectly straight. So I walked into my English class and my English teacher was also the drama teacher at the high school. So they were reading a play called Oedipus Rex. And Oedipus is a Greek tragedy where the guy uh, Oedipus is prophesied to kill his father, marry his mother, and then father a daughter with his mother. So clearly in the play, the father at the time had the boy banished. So my teacher assigned parts to everybody in the class. So I was reading the part of Oedipus. So it was a Greek tragedy. I was going through what I was going through. And I put a lot of emphasis in reading the part when my part came up. So uh, the theater teacher, long story short, the theater teacher said, you need to come down to the theater. So that's how the acting began right after I got hurt playing football. Then I moved to Atlanta. And theater was my foundation for a lot of years because that just was the easiest thing to get involved with at the time. You know. Atlanta wasn't what it is today as far as the epicenter of filmmaking and all these wonderful, talented filmmakers and directors and writers and actors weren't here doing doing it on the level we're doing it now. Mm -hmm. So uh, in 98, there was one young brother who had just graduated from school himself named Will Packer. Y'all may be familiar with him now, but Will and his directing partner started a company called Rainforest Productions here in Atlanta back in the day. And that is my introduction to film. I auditioned at Will's house 
and uh, ended up getting a part and did the movie. And we were a part of the entire process, not just filming, but we did some marketing. I was I moved back to Savannah at the time in 98, 99. And we did some promotions for the film and we got it in the local theaters and it was real grassroots. It was a beautiful thing to be a part of it and see it come to fruition. And uh, at that point, that's when the bug bit me with the film and TV or with the film thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been chasing that ever since, Mario. <laughs> nah, man, I um, really respect your journey. So with, I was in, you know, I was in your live or whatever and um, I was on one, listening to one of your shows or whatever and you said, Something about having an empathetic ear. Mm -hmm. saying, mm -hmm. like, how it's important for communication and having an empathetic ear. Could you explain a little bit about that? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, one of the biggest things with humanity is our ability to empathize with one another. Mm -hmm. And we live in a high tech, low touch society today. You know, a lot of times we get caught up in the current, you know, technological waves. And we forget that the greatest thing that we can do is just empathize or listen and connect with people on a real intimate level instead of just on a surface level that we do a lot of through the social media. You know, we don't really get to know anybody. So we can't grow that empathetic ear. But as artists, I think it is important that, especially creative artists, that we really understand the humanity of the audience that we're trying to create for. You know, to understand that these people are going through real issues, just like we are. Mm. And if we can address those issues in one form or fashion, it demonstrates an empathetic ear. And we're not tone deaf to the realities of what our people are enduring. So, you know, I know that uh, a lot of times the blame, blame mentality was real popular where everybody wanted a lot of you know material things. And we 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 fail to understand that a lot of our community wasn't in position to acquire those things, but yet we still continue to write and emphasize and celebrate just those things that were materialistic. So I felt like that was a lot of tone deaf, creative energy where we could help our people through our art as opposed to harming our people through our art. You know, I harken back to the 60s and the 70s when a lot of the music was uplifting, a lot of the music was fueling the revolution that was going on mm -hmm. as opposed to counteracting the revolution. So being empathetic allows us to, to understand what others are going through and put ourselves in their position so then we can use our platform and our gifts and talents to be of greater service to those people by just truly having an empathetic ear. Mm, I like that, man. Um, and you said it correlates to when you're on set too, like directing, like um, when the director is directing you, you gotta have the, that ear as well. Without question. Without question, you know, there's several styles of direction. You know that, you know what I'm saying? As a director yourself, you know, I, I also am a director, you know, I'm just starting to write and direct my own films. And that empathetic ear is almost uh, uh, paramount for a director because in order to get the very best performance out of your, 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 your artists, they have to be comfortable. They have to know you care because there's a saying that my grandmother would always give me back in the day. She said, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm. So we can be knowledgeable all day. Mm. We can have the best shot list. We can have the best plan of action. But if our humanity is not in place enough to where our empathetic ear is what we're hearing the world through, then we're going to lose those people that we want to trust us because no, again, like my grandmother says, they don't care how much you know until they first know how much you care. And if they know you care, then they'll go to the ends of the earth to make you happy and to do the things that you need them to do to make the project successful. So as a director, an empathetic ear is paramount in order to get the best performance from your artist and not just your artist, but your, your, your crew. You know, your crew is just as valuable. You want to let them know how valuable they are. You want to you know, you want to have empathy for their situations, you know, and, and, and let them know, man, I care about every facet of your life, not just what you can do for me. Because as a whole individual, you become a happy individual and a happy individual is who I want around me. Mm. So you have a you know, background in doing theater and television. What is the, the biggest difference in doing theater and then doing, you know, movie and television? Excellent question. I think the biggest difference is intimacy. 
you know, on the stage is super intimate. You only get one time to do it. It's live. You feel the energy is palpable. You know, you get, you know, a visceral reaction when you're in a theater, not only as an actor, but as an audience member. You know what I'm saying? So it's immediate. You don't have an opportunity to do it more than once to, or on in that moment. We're going to do the play multiple times, but the play itself, it runs from beginning to end. And if something happens, you got to make it work. With film and television, it's not as intimate, but it can be more focused. It can be more laser focused. We can go deeper into storytelling. We can unlock more. We can do more. You know, the set on a stage is limited to the stage and your imagination. But with film and television, we're able to give you that. We're able to help your imagination by putting you in the settings, putting the actors in the scenarios. And therefore, we can rehearse it and do it more times. Therefore, we can get a, a more uh, a, a more exact product every single time. And it lasts forever, you know? And it's way more, with film and television, you don't have to be so big. Mm -hmm. It's more so really a recreation of reality as opposed to an interpretation of reality that we do on stage. We interpret reality on stage. We recreate reality with film and television because we have the luxury, the technology, and of course we have the time and the resources to do that when we have an opportunity to do film and television. So right. it's, they're both very important, you know, both very important. We can get more done. Actors on stage don't make nearly as much as actors in film and TV, nor do directors or anyone because it's small. You can only get three, 400 people in a the theater. But with the movie, man, we get 2 million people to watch it in one swept. So you're able to broaden your p potential and, and, and heighten your reach with film and television, which is why you make more money. <laughs> it makes sense. It makes sense. Let's yeah. shout out to Sheila from the Bronx, man. Um, the Bronx, they say you're the LeBron James of the, of the film world, man. You know, uh, tell us about Sheila that. from the Bronx. That's my girl. <laughs> We love Sheila from the Bronx. <laughs> Sheila from the Bronx was a theater usher when I did my last show down at the Horizon Theater here in Atlanta, down at Little Five Points. Did a show called Square Blue. And uh, because I still got to get on stage. I'm a thespian through and through. So okay. I can't go two or three years without doing something <laughs> on stage. So my last rendition was in August, and Sheila was an usher. And I'm telling you, man, she made the entire cast feel special. But she absolutely made me feel, feel special with her shirt, the LeBron James Theater. And she wore it to the theater on the final night. So uh, it was a blessing. And I'm so excited. But that's the intimacy of theater. You really get to know people, man. And you get to build relationships. <laughs> get to up front and personal. So, man, that was dope. When I saw that shirt, man, I was like, that's dope. That's but dope. That's, that was so dope. <laughs> You're on um, um, Never Would Have Made It. Marvin Sapp, right? Uh, That's right. Yeah, man. How, how was that? The that experience and um, you know, dope film, true story. How was that whole experience? It was wonderful, man. You know, working with Swirl Pictures and uh, you know, working with Russ Parr and the team over there. You know, yourself included. You know, everybody that was on that film was absolutely amazing. Uh, it was good because I got to be old and young at the same time. <laughs> you know, I got to age. I was the the, the father of the young Marvin. Mm -hmm. And the father of the older Marvin, so there was a nice arc there, and uh, you know any opportunity to be be a part of something that's bigger than yourself. You know, Marvin Sapp's story is is very inspirational, and a lot of people could benefit from it. So that's the type of art I like to make. I like to make art that is universal, man. You know what I'm saying? You know, I like the family to be able to sit down and watch it together. Mm -hmm. So that was an honor. That was an honor and a privilege to be a part of that production. What motivation did you pull from in, in that when you had to play that role to get there? Like, what did your what did the motivation come from Lee, to actually be able to play, you know, that role, that age and all that? Being a father, getting older myself, you know what I'm saying? I understand the struggle. I have four kids, man. And, uh, you know, I understand the struggles of fatherhood. But I love the fact that the film demonstrated that it was really Marvin's father that inspired the song Never Would Have Made It, not just his love and his relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times, especially in the modern times, Mario, you know, fathers have been cast as the villain in a lot of scenarios. You know, a lot of young black men seem to want to be mad at their daddy because it's trendy. You know, it's like, well, I, you know, my daddy, this, my daddy, that. 
but I was really grateful to see Marvin Sapp's story being told through the love of his father, you know, having those moments where his daddy was working and wasn't there all the time. Nonetheless, he Marvin understood that his daddy loved him and, and, and wanted nothing but the best for him. And that's what most black daddies want. And you know what I'm saying? Most daddies in general, I'm speaking from the black father perspective because that's what I am. But as a father in general, it, it transcends race and all of that. It's really about just, you know, making sure your kids understand you just really want the best for them. And every day, it may not always translate the way you want it to, but seeing shows like Marvin Sapp's story and seeing that in the mass media, should definitely help some private people. Like we say, have an empathetic ear, man. Understand what other people are going through. So uh, it was important. And just my experience as a father really helped leverage my experience on that show. So it was great, man. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, man. Dope stuff, man. We, you know, appreciate everything you're doing. Every time you bring that energy and bring your presence to the screen, man. Um, love that. What about playing uh, alongside with Chaz, man? How was that, man? Because he's oh, Chaz was great. <laughs> Chaz was great. You know, Chaz, Chaz was a part of uh, the Temptations. You know, them Temptations, that, that movie, The Temptations back in the day. That's my movie. <laughs> Everybody movie. You know what I'm saying? So I've worked with, uh, I worked with uh, Malik Whitfield. That's my guy. We did a little work on Atlanta. He worked with my wife on If Loving You Was Wrong, and he played a huge part in The Temptations. So working with Chaz, after having seen him so long and, and you know, so many times, it was a blessing. And that brother is a genuine, genuine soul, man. That brother is a, you know, beautiful daughter, beautiful family man. You know, he's a a, a very generous artist mm -hmm. and a, a beautiful brother. So it was a blessing to meet and work with that cat for sure. Yeah, that's dope. You are HOA president. I don't know if you still are or not, but uh, what what is HOA, man? What's that? HOA is the Homeowners Association, man. When my wife and I moved here to Atlanta, we moved into a beautiful black community on the south side of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And we call it Wakanda. <laughs> and my my heart for service is always being, of course, but it's definitely local. I like to be a local worker, you know, work where I live. So how much more local could you be in your community? This is a 240 home community and it's a little city actually. So the HOA position was something that I didn't really seek out. I wanted to have some say so in the development of my neighborhood, but the community is a little older. So a lot of the other people who were running the community felt like they wanted to kind of get out of the retire, get out of the business and retire a little bit. So I just sort of happened to come at the right time. And it's been a challenge. You know, I hadn't been the president since last year because I focused more this year because the elders felt as if they wanted to sort of take a little control again, which was all good with me because I just want to make sure the community stays beautiful. So, uh, you know, we were in control of a lot of the things that the homeowners were able to do. We, you know, took care of the, 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 what we call common areas in the community where, you know, the flowers and we got lakes out here and, you know, all type of wooded areas that we meet, we want to make, keep clean and the clubhouse and the pool. So it was a lot of management, a lot of management, but mostly community building which I'm all for. So it was something that I certainly had a wonderful time doing. And I may end up doing it again before it's, before it's all said and done. <laughs> you and your, your <laughs> wife was able to play alongside each other uh, in a film. What was yes. that? And was that the first time or that was just recent? Was that the first time you, ever, you guys ever collab on screen? or That was the first that time. Oh. That was the absolute first time. We met on stage in New York. Okay. We met doing the play in, uh, in Brooklyn back in uh, 2004. So we we performed before on stage together, but we had never performed on TV. So uh, I didn't play a husband. I actually had another wife that uh, I was a friend of the family and it was really great. It was on her show called Tom Swift. It was since been canceled, unfortunately, but it was a wonderful show and they may pick it up somewhere else, but uh, she was dynamic in it. And we can always have the memory of Tom Swift knowing that it was our first time <laughs> working together on TV. So uh, that was a real blast for sure. I think that's that's you no know, dope that you know y'all got that going, that bond, and why yeah, do you have a strong partner um, in this industry? It's vital. I mean, I wouldn't have made it. I never would have made it without my without my wife, man. Not in life or this business. You know, it's it's just really wonderful to have a partner in the business because right. it's practical, 
because we audition together. She's my reader. I'm her reader. Mm. You know, she understands when, you know, working on sets and the demands and all that. You know what I'm saying? You know what? Here, let me uh, let me get in this. Uh, I got a call coming in. I'm trying to deny it right quick. Is that bothering you, Mario? Did oh, I mess up right. anything? With you? No, I'm good. Good, good. Okay, cool. All right, it'll, it'll go away. Yeah. So, but yeah, the partner aspect is, is is invaluable, man. You know, having somebody to understand the ins and outs of the business, as well as the the psychological stuff. You know, when you ain't booking or when things ain't going the way you want them to, you know, you having somebody there that understands and, and able to encourage you. You know, and we do that for one another. I do it for her. She does it for me. So uh, I can't even quantify how valuable it is to have a partner in the business, man. Yeah, it's much, much needed. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you recently posted, uh, when I is replaced by we, even illness becomes wellness. Malcolm X, man, what, what does that mean to you? I think no man is an island. No woman is an island, you know, and we live in the real, again, this technological age can put us on an island. You know, you don't need to leave your house to do much of anything anymore. You know, you can get your, you can get your quote unquote socialization through the social media apps. Mm -hmm. You can order food. You can, you can, you know, get top rate movies delivered right to your house, you know? So literally the technology has isolated us so much that we don't understand that we need each other to survive. You know what I mean? We see the, the suicide rate, the depression rate. We see everything that's associated with human beings not being happy on the increase in today's society. And I believe it's because we look at our lives as individuals and not as a part of a unit. We are very tribal people as African-Americans. It is in our DNA. We need to be, we need each other. So I think when we take the, the, the eye, you know, out of so many of the things that we're doing in our lives and, and create more of a we, more of a communal aspect, then we can negate some of the depression that we're facing because we can bounce some of these things off of real people instead of just believing what we see or the or, or what we've been told or sold on the internet. You know, so I think what Malcolm said years ago was even more relevant to in today's society because we've moved so far away from the us right. and locked so much into the eye, you know, that we lost control a lot of times of our ability to, to to maintain our social relevance and our value to the people. So we feel like, you know, what, what's the use? I, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and again, that's what causes a lot of the depression and a lot of the suicidal thoughts when people feel useless, right. you know, hopeless, like they're not a part of something bigger than them. Right. But that's never the case. You know, you always can tap into something greater than you by just being a part of a bigger tribe and, you know, allowing yourself to be of service to others as opposed to putting everything on you. You know what I mean? I agree. That was powerful. Yeah. What is film? What was the film like in Los Angeles? Um, I know you, you lived there for a minute. What was that film business like? Um, Man, it was rough. It was rough because and, and, and while I moved to Atlanta, when we moved to L.A., the intention was for both April and I to go into film and television together. But April ended up sticking with it because I hated it, bro. You know, when we moved out there, it was, you know, shows like The Shield and, you know, all these other cop dramas and numbers and different cop dramas. And, you know, the auditions after coming from New York off the stage doing A Raisin in the Sun and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom and real theater work, I really, to be honest, man, felt that the film... The TV stuff was just beneath me, man. I was like, this ain't the work that I want to be a part of. It's not telling anything. It's not moving us as a people forward. It's not nourishing me as an artist. So I ended up finding theater in LA. Crazy as that sounds, you know, we started a theater, you know, called the Black Gents of Hollywood. Me and uh, a couple other actors who are now in Atlanta, Lamont Rucker, Tom, uh, Tom Scott, you know, uh, these are some of the founding members of the group who are here in Atlanta right now. The writing uh, producer, director was Leon Gray, who lives in New York. So in New York, in L.A., man, I still found the film mm -hmm. and ended up really getting into film and theater, and film and TV when we came back to Atlanta in 2016, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. How, how you wasn't, you know, 
feeling something, but you still found something in a situation. Uh, that's that's how life goes, and that's how it goes. that's how life goes. You know, we find we find what we need where we need it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, it, 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 and although LA ain't known for theater, there is a theater scene there. It's small, and it ain't gonna make no money. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's certainly fulfilling, and it and it and it and it serves your heart well to be able to be in something because all the shows that we did were about black people. You know, our, our, our uh, signature show was a show called The Black Angels over Tuskegee. And it was about the Tuskegee Airmen and their struggles as black aviators back in World War II. So, you know, it was a huge deal to be a part of that and to be a part of a group of black creators, of black men creators. So, uh, you know, we, we find what we need where we need it, when we need it, my dear brother. You know, Jay, it's, it's somebody who's listening to this right now and they... And they're probably feeling discouraged. They've been to a lot of um, auditions. Mm -hmm. You know, they're probably doing background work and probably not really getting to what they want to do. And right now, they're feeling like, you know what? It's, I want to quit. Um, yeah. By you being a veteran and knowing this business, what advice you could give them right now that probably can keep them some you know, words that can keep them going? The best is yet to come for you. The best is still yet to come for you. But you have to continue to train and edify your temple. Keep working. Find ways to become your own creator while you're waiting on them to give you permission to work. Write. Go toward those areas that you're not strong in. If you're a wonderful singer, then don't worry about singing. Sing, but you may need to bone up on your acting, your character development, your memorization. These are some of the things that you need to work on. If you don't like to write, write. You know, if writing is a try, just continue, just write short stories, write a poem, write something that you can learn to build that muscle with. Don't allow just time to sit, the, the, the situation to dictate to you what your life will become. You dictate it. I understand auditions are a paramount part of getting a job. You can't get the job without auditions and we can't control what we cannot control. But you can control what you can control. So do it. Control it. Write more. Be creative. Learn. Get in the front of the right people. Don't patronize yourself. But at the same time, a closed mouth don't get fed. Mm. You know, if you're good at what you do, let folks know it. But you got to be able to back up what you say. So make sure you've got all the talent that you need. And you're always a lifelong learner in this business because we recreate reality and reality changes every day. The way people respond to things which change every day. You know what I'm saying? Once upon a time you saw some uh, uh, heard a curse word on the radio, you respond a different way. Today, a curse on the radio, you won't respond at all. Once upon a time, you see naked people on TV, oh my God, you be appalled. <laughs> Today is what you see all the time. So reality changes, so you got to change. You got to be a lifelong learner. And mm. always know the best is yet to come, man. Keep your faith. Keep your faith. Guarantee it. Don't give up on yourself. And if you give up, it ain't giving up. Sometimes it's giving out. You know, and you may take time off. I took 10 years from filming TV. Still did theater but didn't audition for no film and TV for almost 10 years before we moved back to Atlanta. Mm. Then things got good again. I was aged out. I'm a different age now. I'm a di the, the material's different. I can audition from home mm. as opposed to driving out to go in and knock on doors all the time. So sometimes you may need to give out, pause, and then get back at it. Mm. So you gotta be faith-based. Man, without faith, you are no you're lost. You've got to have a faith in something greater than yourself. If you don't believe in that, then you'll take all the brunt on yourself. Sometimes a supernatural belief in something will help you get through those things that you do not understand. You know, a lot of what the world gives us is beyond our understanding. That's why faith is so important, because it gives you an outlet to understand these things are beyond me. But I trust that the best is yet to come for me. I trust that the world is going to work out because I'm putting good energy into the universe and I expect a return. Like with any investment, you invest expecting a return, your money, your time, your energy, the same thing with this business. You have to invest in this business with your time, your energy, your love, your work, your dedication. And as you invest that, expect that the universe is going to give you exactly what you deserve. In this industry, you have a lot of people that want to, pull you and tell you you should do this, you should do that, you should do that. You know, some people have good advice. Some people just want you to be what they want you to be. How do you stay, how could someone stay their self through that, you know, 
with all that, this, 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 you know, just how can they just maintain their, their you know, their own self, their own identity? Throughout? That's an excellent question. Excellent question, Mario, because yes, we all tend to want to do what was popular. We kind of want to go wherever we think is going to get us there fastest, whatever we need to do to do that. And sometimes that's detrimental. So the best thing for you to do is have a strong value system. Know who you are before you even enter the, if you know your, 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 your values and your moral commitment to yourself is greater than any dollar, you know, because I heard a brother the other day say, I'm not chasing money because money is man-made. I'm chasing love because love is God made. And that's what you got to always realize. You got to realize the most important relationship you have is with your creator, the person, the universal energy, the creator, that faith that we just talked about. That's a vital relationship. You don't want to bridge or breach that relationship for something man-made because man-made stuff is fallible. It breaks down. It's, it's not perfect. You know what I'm saying? We know it's not perfect. But the relationship you have with your creator can be perfect because it's something that's intimate to you and your connection. So you come into this business, you're going to be tried. They're going, they're going to be individuals, to your point, who want you to think the way they do, even if it goes against your moral commitment to yourself. It goes against your moral values because you want to make some money. Money's man-made. Don't chase no money. Chase the joy and satisfaction of knowing you're doing what God created you to do. And if you're walking in your purpose, you will be rewarded. You will be gifted. You will. God said your gifts and talents will make way for you. And that's God honest truth. If you're adding value, people are going to see your value. Trust me. So you have to maintain a level of integrity when it comes to your moral center. And knowing that that center is where you always find your way back to. When you get pulled to the left or get pulled to the right, you always want to find your way back to your center and edify your center by making sure you stay keeping your faith edified. You know what I'm saying? Doing those things to keep your faith strong because it's going to be tested in this business without question. That's for sure. Um, health, health. Um, I know you, you know, you're big on the fitness thing. Yes, how, sir. Um, how did the fitness thing, you know, all come about? Um, I had to make a living in California. You mm -hmm. know, I wasn't acting. So I had to come up with something. And because I was an actor and a former football player, I would train myself at the YMCA when I was when we were in California. So I started doing that. That's why I got my first job as a personal trainer in, in the YMCA in Studio City in California, Los Angeles. And that opened up my eyes to the need. Again, as a man of service, wherever there's a need, I try to fill that need if I'm capable, if I have a skill set to do so. Mm -hmm. So fitness was something that came natural to me. You know, I'm 50 years old right now, and I always say fitness is the fountain of youth. If you want to stay healthy and you want to stay youthful as long as you can, exercise. So we became, I, I, I started to evangelize fitness. So my moniker became the fitness minister because mm -hmm. I would always say fitness is physical praise and worship you know we give a lot of lip service to the creator but if you want to do something you got to sweat you got to create something physical so this is my physical way of saying i'm grateful i'm grateful for a healthy body i'm grateful for a healthy mind i'm grateful for the ability to do these things that i'm able to do so if you give if someone gave you a gift and you never used it you never showed them how much you appreciated it then typically somebody may want that gift back Mm -hmm. So if you don't take your health seriously, you're going to lose it. God mm -hmm. going to take that health from you because you're not edifying it. You're not using it the way you were supposed to. So the gift giver going to look like, hey, well, you don't need it. You don't want it. You don't appreciate it. Yeah. So that's why we came up with the fitness minister. And I am going to be the fitness minister until the end of my life. There's no way that I can turn this on. It's a habit, not a hobby for me now. So wherever I go, even on the movie sets, TV sets, Fitness is always going to be a conversation I'm having because I want everybody to live their very best life. And you can't do it if you ain't healthy, baby. Mm. How do you stay healthy on the sex? You know, you got crafty right there. You're not yeah. in your normal space. You might not even be in your normal state that, you, that you're in, depending on the movie. But how do you, you know, still maintain it with being on set and still being healthy? That's the excellent question, because you're absolutely right, bro. They got all the stuff you could imagine on these sets, man. You can have as much of it as you want. So you typically find yourself grazing around those uh, 
crafty tents and those snack tents as often as you can. It's a mentality, though. Again, like I said, it's a habit, not a hobby. And at this point in the game, 80 percent of what you do as far as your fitness goals are associated with what you're eating. Twenty percent is your exercise and physical work. So 80 percent of it is what we're eating. So if, if, if that high of a percentage will dictate my health and wellness, then clearly it's important. So I try to find myself the healthiest snacks on set, you know, because the crafties have gotten hip. You know, they got tuna now. They got little pickles. You know, they got little things that you can eat as opposed to the M&Ms and the honey buns and stuff. So you try to gravitate toward the healthiest stuff. You try to drink the water. Mm -hmm. They keep plenty of water on sets. Mm -hmm. So you do those things that you know are right. You show those people around you what you're doing, and hopefully that encur encourage them to do the right thing too. And as far as exercise, I use resistance bands and just body weight exercises. So while I'm in the trailer, you know, I, I bring my little workout gloves so I can do my push-ups and everything right in the trailer. The bands are very portable, so you can put those in your in your trailer. And no matter how big or small the trailer is, you still got enough room to, to do some chest work and do some arm work to just get your blood flowing in your body. So you always have to find a way to get it in because there always is a way to get it in, especially when it comes to, you know, health and wellness on the set, specifically when it comes to nutrition. Finding those healthy alternatives are vital. Uh, health is uh, the real wealth. Brother, if you don't believe it, you're going to eat. At some point, you're going to understand that. <laughs> I saw one of your interviews, you was like, um, if it don't grow from the ground, don't eat. Or something you were saying, like, if it don't grow from the ground, or if it don't pour from up top of, I can't remember the exact words, but it was yeah. interesting that you, you know what you were saying. That's the idea. God gives, I mean, the, the blueprint is there. You know, manna is water. If it don't fall from the heaven, if God ain't blessing from the heaven, or if it's not growing straight from the earth, then you got to question it. You got to question it. Is this because the food that we need is is provided for us? The man-made stuff. Remember, if man make it, it ain't perfect. The food from the ground is perfect for human for human consumption. It's perfect unless we've destroyed the earth in which it grows. Um, or unless we polluted the skies from which the rain falls. If we leave earth to the way it was, the rain is perfect. The water that we need, we're 80% water. So naturally, we need to keep water flowing through our bodies to create the systems, to help the systems work properly. And the greens, the natural food that grows from the earth, is what God delivered us to maximize our health. So if it's not growing from the ground, and if it ain't falling from the air, you got to question it, brother. You got to question it. <laughs> and I like that, that. That stuck with me. You know, now I can, I'm going to play this back so I can get the right words for it. <laughs> but, My uh, man. Before we get out of here, you know, um, like I said, I really appreciate the time. Legacy. Um, what do you want to be known for? Like, what do you want? When they say Jay Jones, what do you want your name to be attached to? I love it, man. That's a wonderful question, brother. The idea is just excellence, man. I want to, I, if on my tombstone, they said this brother served. Mm. That's what Jesus did. I want to be a service, man. I want to I wanna be a brother that people can say he did what he said he was going to do. Mm. And he loved the people he did it for. You know what I'm saying? He loved the people he did it for, man. I'm doing it for my generation, for my children, my children's children. You know, we got a program before I get you out of here. We got a program that we started four years ago in the elementary schools called Kings. Keep inspiring next generations. And that's what I want my legacy to be able to do, to continue to keep inspiring next generations. I want to be uh, a Malcolm. I want to be a Martin. I want to be a towering enough figure where my life legacy will live forever. And the best way to do that is to be of service like Malcolm to be of service like Martin, to be of service like Muhammad Ali. These are my icons, you know what I'm saying? And all of these men serve their people with their life. And that's exactly what I intend to do, man. And I, I know the best is still yet to come because we got some collaborating to do, my dear my brother Mario, beyond this interview. We got some wonderful art to make and I'm looking forward to it, to add to our legacy together. Oh man, that, that'll mean the world to me, man. I appreciate everything and manifest. Um, like I've been doing something called what you want to manifest lately. Well, I'm just asking everybody what you want to manifest. So, you know, I love it. I want to know what you want to manifest. I want to manifest J. Jones part three, mm. whatever that is. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm 50 years old, 
right now. So I'm looking for whatever God got in this next phase of my life. I want to manifest because I know it's going to be bountiful, beautiful, and of great service to my people. Mm. I like that. Oh, I, I almost that. forgot to ask you was, what does stop shooting mean? Shooting Should. all over yourself. <laughs> we do it all the time, brother. It shooting simply is, I should have, could have, would have did that. Mm. You know, we're going to stop shouldn't and couldn't and would have, should have by just doing what we say we wanted to do. Because the activation energy is all it takes for you to do what you say you're going to do. Because we live in a world where there's this thing called the law of diminishing intent. Now, we say we're going to do something, but if we don't do it in a certain time frame, the, our intention to do it begins to diminish. Mm -hmm. And that's when we fall into that should have, could have, would have. Man, I should have, but I didn't. We don't want to shoot all over ourselves. So when you come up with something, do it immediately. You got five seconds to activate that thing. So if you got a good idea, write it down within five seconds. If you need to make a call immediately, make that call within five seconds. Because after five seconds, slowly, incrementally, your desire to do what you said you were going to do begins to diminish. So don't shoot all over yourself, bro. I like that. <laughs> Man, appreciate y'all. Any last remarks or any positive motivation or quotes or sayings that you want to leave us with? And my favorite saying of all times is the best is yet to come, brother. I already hit you with it once, but I'm going to reiterate it again because it is an affirmation for your future. When you tell yourself the best is yet to come, no matter how good it is now, no matter how bad it is now, you are already empowering yourself to walk in faith and you've, you've, you've electrified your energy by moving in a, in, in, in a powerful state of expectation. And that's why when I say the best is yet to come, then it is the most powerful affirmation I can speak on your life, good sir. Oh, man, I love it, man. Thank you for um, coming through. Um, this is Book Me or Not. Um, we call it the Roller Roll Edition, the film edition. So, man, we, we're blessed for your presence. Thank you for not shooting and always supporting, man, <laughs> uh, everything I, I did. Um, and it's just a blessing, man. You know, um, you know, love to give you flowers now, man. You know, respect what you're doing. Appreciate you. Trying, and like I said, the best is yet to come. Hey, can't wait, man. Part three, man. Can't wait for part three, man. Jay Jones, part three. Jay Thank Jones, you. part three, baby, because you know we made solid, black man. <laughs> <laughs> Mario, I love you, brother. Appreciate you, King. Okay, for sure.